Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Anglo-Italian pod. It's season two, episode 42, but it's especially episode 100 over all. My name is Tommaso. I'm joined by my good friend, Mr. Rory. We're here for the hundredth time. Can you believe it? From that one episode where I still remember we finished it with, we've done it. We've done an episode to now 100. It feels insane we've hit a century i'm pointing my back to the crowd thanks for coming on the journey with us guys how does it feel tommy it feels good man 100 is kind of a benchmark it's actually 101 we need to be precise because there was a little a little something that happened this year we couldn't download one recording and upload it on spotify so it's officially episode 101 but we're gonna make it 100 just for the sake we've we kind of had a little bit of an Ian Wright moment, right? We've lifted the shirt a bit too late, not too early, but we got exactly. there. 100, 101. What's one between friends? It's fine. Don't tell anybody. Cheers to you, man. I'm drinking cheers, something. Here. I'm already. Cheers. We've cheers. finally got. We've. It's been a while since we drank on the pod, so there we go. And uh, it's Saint Valentine's Day, so happy Saint Valentine's to all the lovers out there, including Mr. Rory Crisqualo, who is rocking a brand new Saint Valentine's kit. What is it? She knows me so well. Um, She has bought me a Torino kit. There is a list of kits that I want um, that I have saved on my phone. And one of them was Torino. So uh, she must have access to my phone, which is concerning. But either way, it's a nice gift. It's a nice gift. And Tommy, I did send you a Valentine's card today. Do you want to tell people about the card I sent you? Which card? Wait, wait, wait. On WhatsApp. On, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The Andanovic. uh... (laughs) Exactly. I think I found it from Ballon Dior, who is a uh, Inter Milan fan page. I'm pretty sure it's him who said who shared it. So thank you. But it's it said that the only jump I make is when my heart jumps a beat for you to <laughs> Tommaso from Andanovic. <laughs> I'm gonna show it to our. I don't know if you can really see, but yeah, there, there it is. There you go. It's beautiful. Pink as well. Yeah, of course, we are live on Twitch and YouTube since it's a Monday night. And uh, if you're not listening on a Monday night, you're doing it all wrong. Make sure you come as many as possible to our uh, live streams uh, because they're fun. And there are a lot of people interacting, including the hopeless wanderer that says we should bring in Vuvuzelas to celebrate we, the one. We really have missed a trick there. We really did miss a trick. <laughs> I Man, should have brought one on. Honestly, if somebody ever walks into my apartment with a Vuvuzela playing it, I am going, that is the closest I'm going to get to murder. <laughs> I'm just noting that down, right? Yeah, just yeah, yeah. That, down. that would be yeah, the closest. Yeah. And I'm already saying it in this pod. I can imagine the Netflix documentary, my lawyers saying, hey, actually, my, my assistant, he, uh, he said it live he one did time. Warn he, he, he did, did warn you. He did warn you. He did warn people. <laughs> but Rory, before we start, there is a lot to talk about Chelsea our world champion in uh, world champions in Serie A it was goalkeeper galore I want to say this weekend in the Premier League Antonio Conte loses the third consecutive game for the first time in 12 years but before we get to all of this we need to kind of just talk about the 100th episode and uh, I don't know what has what has been your favorite moment so far in this uh, journey there's been a lot. I think any of the interviews and guests we've had on has have been amazing. But I think the, the first one where I was like, oh, this is like, this feels big, was when we had Filippo Giovagnoli from Dundalk. Because it was like an active manager in the game. He'd been up against Arsenal. It was like, it felt like a really big moment. And like, when he was coming on, he was a little bit late, do you remember? And we were just mm-hmm. like, oh God, what if he doesn't turn up? Like, what are we going to do? And like genuinely nervous thinking, why would he come on the pod anyway? Of course he's not going to turn up. Then he turned up. He was a great guy. It was a great interview. And that was like the first time I was like, oh, we're doing something here. I think we're doing something. So I think that moment stands out. But honestly, all of the interviews we've done, like Paul Watson, um, Eamon Zayed, these are the ones that just come into my head. They've all been great interviews. Sheriff Suma, the AFCON. I've enjoyed a lot of it. What about you, Tommy? Well, yeah, no, I remember Filippo Giovagnoli. Of course, listeners, you can go back to season one. Uh, maybe I'm going to find the episode two. By the end of this episode, we will tell you where to mm-hmm. find them. But Filippo Giovagnoli was actually a lot of fun. And I remember when he when he pissed out and it was only me and you on the call. We were just like, fuck it. Mm-hmm. We've done it. It's done. And that <laughs> exactly. was beautiful. There was the, because he's Italian, there was really the Anglo-Italian connection. He's Italian. He was coaching Dundalk at the time, your mom's town. Mm-hmm. So it really felt like a, like a great moment. 
I really, really enjoyed the Paul Watson interview as well, but yeah. also yeah, yeah. I can also Titi Odell um, mm-hmm. when he was going to pick up his uh, son from volleyball <laughs> practice. I want to say, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the interview happened in three different locations: at the gym where he was working <laughs> out, then in his car, and then uh, back at home. Uh, all of them have been a lot of fun, but I want to say one of the funniest moments was seeing the just the mass of people that reached out to us from Iran when we did the Ayman Zayed yeah. interview. Um, people writing in Arabic, things that I couldn't understand at all. You couldn't, I couldn't even copy and paste on Google Translator because I because I don't know Arabic, so I couldn't copy the <laughs> letters, you know. Uh, yeah. That was a great moment, too. Eamon was great, and we're going to have soon on the pod a friend of Eamon mm. uh, that reached out to us during that episode. So, yeah, man, feels good. Feels good. It, I, I honestly can't believe it. 100, here's to many hundreds more. We'll see how it goes, eh? <laughs> we'll yeah, and thanks to all the people that, that uh, keep following us. Monde Sportif, mm-hmm. The Hopeless Wanderer, um, Joe Spagnoli, Steve Cole. Steve Cole, all of them. Thank you so much, guys, for always being there. Uh, and uh, hopefully to 100 more. There Cheers. we go. To 100 more episodes. But I think we should start talking about football from Chelsea crowned world champions rory from an arsenal perspective how does it feel does it uh is it annoying is it uh, is it is it bitter look i've known for a while that arsenal are no longer the biggest club in london like chelsea are a bigger club i think it's hard to argue any other way now um this as much as like it's a trophy that kind of lots of people don't value it is almost confirmation of that now that they're bigger than it was like not only have they won the Champions League twice but they've now won the Club World Cup like okay it's kind of indisputable if you know what I mean so I think there's a bit of like it's definitely a it's not even bittersweet it's just bitter I don't like Chelsea I don't like the fact that they're better than us it has all changed since Abramovich came in but you have to say as a club they've been ran incredibly well this constant changing of managers has led to a pretty successful, sustained, successful period. It's kind of weird where they are. Like As Hopeless Wanderer have just chipped in now, Chelsea have become the Cup Kings. This is it. They're kind of in this weird nether zone of like a, a team that's a Cup team, not quite good enough to win the league, but got millions and billions of pounds behind them, an incredibly expensively assembled squad, and they're in this kind of weird area. But they just keep winning trophies, and you think, well, if it isn't, broken don't fix it I, I can't help but think they're not too far away from a title challenge they're still missing an out and out goal scorer despite throwing money at Lukaku I think if they had an out and out goal scorer maybe a bit more of a reliable option on the wings I, I feel like Ziek and Pulisic and they're good but they're just not consistent enough hudson Adoy. so I think there's still some improvement to be done in that team but they are they're still getting trophies every season like even managers like Sadi who are kind of his time is derided. He won the Europa League. Benitez, they hated. He won the Europa League. Like, if you know what I mean, they do just win things. So I think it's a great moment for them. I did love the mind games from Aspilicueta on the was um, final man. penalty. That was beautiful. I love it. It was great to see, right? I'm surprised more teams don't do it. But like how he kind of just let him take all the attention, then last minute just gave it to Havertz. There you go. You take it. He's now scored the winning goal in the Champions League and Club World Cup final. That's pretty huge, like, at 22 years old. And again, like I said, I know in Europe we don't really respect that competition. But in South America, they really give a shit about that competition. And, like, yeah, of course. Uh, all around the world they do. It's just that we don't. I don't understand why we don't. I think it's like... I would I love think, Arsenal to win it. Bloody hell, we'd have to win the Champions League to win it. I'd love to win that trophy. Like, I think I think they don't. We don't give that much of a shit because we kind of know that the 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 the, mm-hmm. the team that won the Champions League is probably the strongest in yeah. that. Competition. You should win it, really. You should win it. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's only two games to get to the final, and mm-hmm. you're gonna rest the players, the games before the Club World Cup, and then you're just gonna go there and win it. But let's not forget that Lukaku, the man who has been on and off for Chelsea, also is in the score line of this game, having scored the one nil against the Palmeiras in the World Cup final. Yeah, Hopeless Wanderer says it feels like an exhibition match as opposed to be prestigious. Yeah, I agree. I think kind of the setting does that as well. I was listening to the Totally Football Show today and they put it much more eloquently than me, but I think they made a really point. The setting of where it is makes it feel like it's at Disneyland because it's in Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia or Dubai. And the timing of it, the fact that 
like I think I can't remember who it was who was talking about it, but they said if you put it at the end of the season, like straight, like maybe a week after the Champions League final or after the chat after the continental competition competition finals you would take it a bit more seriously because it would feel like closer whereas now it kind of feels like so long ago that chelsea won it you're like all right yeah but now we're concentrating on this year's champions league who gives a shit if you know what i mean so i think the time in the stage doesn't help um but we've got to say palmeiras are a decent side right they've won back-to-back copa de libertadores They've done it by defending and doing nothing else, but they're a very good team. So they gave Chelsea a decent match. And um, yeah, I was kind of hoping they'd win it, obviously. I think the a Brazilian side hasn't won it for a while. I'm trying to remember. but Yeah, off the top of my head, they haven't. I feel like in the past five years, I want to say. it was. I remember really... Chelsea lost to... No, wait, I thought, no, that was a Super Cup, wasn't it? Anyway... Guys, I haven't done my research. <laughs> help us out on the chat. <laughs> and before we jump to league football, I just wanted to ask you, Rory, uh, for our American listeners, did you watch the Super Bowl at all? No, did you? Did you not? Yeah, I got to halftime. I got to the halftime show and then I went to bed because I had work at eight o'clock this morning. Um, so I did stay up for a bit. I really enjoyed it. Arsenal won the Super Bowl, which is uh, fantastic. Um, Arsenal won the Super Bowl. The the LA Rams are owned by the Cronkies. Um, oh. So it's especially galling seeing that incredible stadium. Did you see the stadium, Tommy? Yeah, like the five stadium billion stadium. dollar stadium. Unbelievable. You're like, that's where our striker is. That's where our transfer budget is. Um, look, Cronkies won it now. He's won the Super Bowl with the LA Rams. Now it's time to win the Premier League with Arsenal. Please, can you please just give us some money? Um, so yeah, congratulations, LA. And I just wanted I just wanted to share a very well food, um, n- now that with the social media everything is more international. A lot of clubs in Europe have like shared their clip about their players dressed up as uh, American football players and stuff. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to share um, the Super Bowl team selected by transfer market official, uh, which has De Bruyne as quarterback, uh, Adama Traore and Davies <laughs> as running backs. I like that. Mbappé and Obama Young as wide receivers. Oof. I don't understand why Obama Young is wide receivers. Because he's rapid, that's why. Is it that fast, right? Yeah. Then uh, we've got our O-line, which is Van Dyke as tackle, <laughs> Koulibaly as guard, Akin Fenwa as center. Yes, <laughs> I can see that. Lukaku that's as it. guard on the right and Upamecano as tackle. And then the tight end, who could it be if not Cristiano Ronaldo, of course? Oh, I like that. I like that. The only one I take out is Upamecano. I'm really not in- impressed by that guy at all, but I like that team. I like that team. And I also like the fact, and this is a nice little leeway for you, Rory, since you created a pretty funny meme today, that the Super Bowl was overshadowed by Kanye West absolutely (laughs) going insane on social media. This is like when, I don't know, it's like I saw a very funny meme about like Kanye West's social media managers right now, like sweating bollocks. Oh, it's that picture of Ben Affleck having a cigarette where he's just outside (laughs) looking desperate. It's like Kanye West's media team It was the Matthew McConaughey picture of him just like (laughs) sucking on a cigarette big time. Um, But yeah, that created, that gifted us a beautiful picture of Kanye saying, my account hasn't been hacked, which Rory modified with the saying, my account hasn't been hacked act i have changed my mind about rafael leao have you rory what did it take you did you have to suck your dick like we said <laughs> no no i can confirm he did not i'm sure he would not like those rumors to be bandied about willy-nilly um well <laughs> this might be a huge surprise to the to listeners but football manager changed my mind <laughs> um i I'm currently doing a glory hunter um, inspired by Dr. Benji on YouTube. If you're into football manager, definitely check that guy out. He's a great streamer where you have to win all the five major leagues, Champions League, World Cup. You have to win everything. Basically, I've won it all with Arsenal, won it all with Real Madrid. I had to go to Italy and Serie A offered me the job. Um, AC Milan offered me the job. So I've gone to them and Liao has been unbelievable for me. So now I'm convinced he's a great player. Meanwhile, I saw him score that goal at the weekend, uh, which was a beautiful goal. And I was like, ah, maybe... Maybe I did make my mind up too quickly off that one game I saw him play against Lazio when I was in the stadium. Maybe I do give this guy another chance. Um, I mean, yeah, maybe having, you were right. He he's having an incredible season, and he's so rapid. Um, he's so fucking rapid in that. Mm-hmm. Goal. It's ridiculous. the way the way he cuts out the defender. You can there is there was um, there was an angle from which you could see the defender like the moment that he's like, all right, I got him, and 
one split second after Liao mm -hmm. is past him. So that was a beautiful, beautiful goal. Of course, this is the probably the most important game of this weekend uh, with AC Milan winning by measure against the Sampdoria. But wasn't it for the Sampdoria goalkeeper, Vladimiro Falcone, this game could have easily ended 4 or 5 nil. Now, this guy, apparently, he's been... I mean, apparently, you can go check on Transfer Market or on Wikipedia. He's been around for a while, a lot of loans around Italy. Uh, and now he's become the first string goalkeeper for Sampdoria and Audero, uh, who started as the first string. Right now, he's, uh, he's on the bench. Rightfully so, uh, incredible saves. My favorite one was the bottom, the one on the bottom left uh, mm -hmm. on uh, Junior Messias. That was a super hard shot to save. Um, the ball was going to go in all the time, but he dives perfectly, saves it. Beautiful save. He had another one uh, face to face with Rebic. Then Olivier Giroud tried a bicycle kick, mm -hmm. saved that one too, kept that one out. Outstanding goalkeeping. Gazzetta dello Sport gave him a seven and a half uh, out of ten, which for a goalkeeper is actually very, very impressive. You don't see that very often. And that means that AC Milan, Man. slowly but surely, they're top of the league. However, Inter still have that game in hand to be played against the Bologna. Rory, do you think they've got what it takes to win the league? This title race is going to be. It's going to be a good one. Um, I think they're showing that they have more grit than last year. Like last mm -hmm. year, they kind of they felt like they'd won the league in I'm going to say October, right? They were yep. kind of saying doing all the things on the pitch, like celebrating a bit too much. I feel like they kind of learned from that a bit. They're getting big results. Um, obviously, <laughs> the Milan derby that doesn't do any damage to their chances, and like almost a bigger game after that is like. After a derby like that, it's almost a bigger game than one after it, just to make sure that you can cement it. So it's not like after the Lord Mayor show. So you just beat your rivals, but then lose to Sampdoria. Like it's really important that you then get that three points and just keep the ball rolling. I think it's a huge moment for them, especially with the current run of fixtures that that Inter have. Like you've been talking about how hard this run of form, is, how hard this run of fixtures is for Inter. You had Napoli this weekend. It was key for them to take advantage, and they did. I think the only thing that concerns me for them is that they don't really score that many. They don't. It doesn't feel like they score many, um, and the average age of their front line is like fifty-five. So I think that's where maybe towards the end of the season we might see them fall away a little bit. But they've definitely got a chance. They definitely have got a chance. They've got the next two fixtures. Uh, fixtures are away at Salerno and uh, then at home against Udinese. So probably six points right there. The tough one is going to be on March 6th against the Naples away. And then the only other big team that they have to face is on the penultimate match day, Atalanta at home. Before that, they have Lazio. Lazio is an unpredictable team this year. Mm -hmm. I don't consider them a big team necessarily, but that could be... A possible banana slip, even though they walked past them with quite the ease in the Coppa Italia, 4-0. It was a pretty easy win for them. On the other hand, Inter Milan, 1-1 at the uh, Stadio Maradona. Did you watch this game? What do you think about it? I did. That was a bad first half. Well, a bad first half an hour from Inter. I think towards mm -hmm. the end of the first half, Inter started to come into it. But at the beginning, Napoli were just all over you like a rash. Inter could not get out of their own half. There was a few moments where Napoli could have had a few more goals in that first half hour. Arguably Zelinski should have done. hitting the post, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think Osserman looked dangerous. I, I think I WhatsApped you halfway through it. Like, Tommy, they're just running through your midfield. Like, yeah. it was... There was no resistance there at all. I feel like Inter did really well to hold on and keep it 1-0 at half time. right? Flying out in the second half, get that goal, that's big. And then the game, it just seemed like they were both trading blows, but no one was able to get that final goal. But I think Inter really were lucky in that first half. How did you see that performance? What do you think it tells you about the rest of the season? Well, I think that seeing how the game started, especially the first 15 minutes, I was just like, oh my God. Like, I have mm -hmm. not seen Inter Milan in the spite, not, not even in the games against Real Madrid, because in the games against Real Madrid, it was pretty even. We were exchanging blows throughout. But against Napoli, the first 10, 15 minutes, Napoli were there to hurt us. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that Zielinski shot, those usually go in. I have to say one thing. Andarovic dove. 
multiple times. Yeah, yeah, he, he, did, he did. He almost he did. saved the penalty. He almost saved the penalty too. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was actually very. I think that the takeaway for Inter Milan is that if things go, if things look dangerous like they did in Napoli, we can hold on and reorganize ourselves mid game through. So that was the good takeaway, I think, mm-hmm. that despite all the pressure that Napoli were applying, we still managed to stay in the game, let them play. And then at a point, it felt like Napoli were kind of running out of ideas and we took advantage. Towards the end of the first half, I thought we were going to score one. We didn't. We did right away in the first minute of the second one. Players that I was very impressed with, really, Federico Di Marco substituting, mm-hmm. uh, replacing uh, Alessandro Bastoni as a uh, left center back. He had an incredible game, very good. Denzel Dumfries, always dangerous, always in position. He also had a very, very good game. And uh, it's terrible to say, but Stefan de Vrij not having the best start to 2022, mm-hmm. really. Um, it was his birthday soon, and it's unfortunate to see him underperforming. He's cost us at least five points, I want to say. I mean, yeah. He Let's kept say, getting caught out of position, I think. He kept yeah, getting caught and, out. Yeah, uh, and, well, the penalty was all his fault, mm-hmm. really. And uh, in the derby against AC Milan, uh, it was the, we can split the fault between him and Landanovic mm-hmm. on uh, Giroud's second goal. So, yeah, not really in form. Hopefully, we're going to get there very soon. He's going to be back in shape against Liverpool on Wednesday night. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed for you, genuinely. But I think there's two players for Napoli that I really wanted to shout out that I was really impressed by. Marion Rui, or Mario Rui, I thought was Mario unbelievable, Rui. just flying up and down that wing. Someone that I thought, I maybe I just haven't seen him that much. I didn't know he was that good. And a player that never really started for Napoli, but I think since he's come into the team, I've been like, why doesn't that guy start more? Lobotka was unbelievable. And every mm-hmm. game I've seen him play, <laughs> he just dictates the pace of play, keeps the ball moving, really good passing range, wins the ball back. Just really impressive. And they were two players that I was like, huh, where have these guys come from? Like, I know Anguissa was still like, they brought him on, so they're still resting and trying to get him back from AFCON. But Lobotka, I was really, really impressed by. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you. He's been kind of revived by by Spalletti this season. Mm-hmm. And uh, Napoli, I mean, it's a, let's not forget that Napoli are there too, right in the race. AC Milan, 55 points. Inter, 54. Napoli, 53. Inter are the only team with one game in hand. The game between the Napoli and the Milan on uh, March uh, 6th is going to be massive for the Scudetto. Who is your, who's your game in hand against? Bologna. So that should be... Okay. Uh, Shoot, it's touch I, I don't want to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to say anything. But Inter yeah. this season have not lost those games, mm-hmm. and but the, the thing is that we must win it because if we yeah. end up in uh, even points with AC Milan, they've got the the direct win against us. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm gonna quickly recap the other Serie A games before we jump to the Premier League and then a Champions League. And the spoiler alert, somebody's got a ticket for the game. <laughs> and I'm so excited. Yes, I am. Also scared, but also excited. So Lazio win 3-0 against Bologna, uh, not conceding any goal from Lazio uh, in their second, conse- third, conse- fourth consecutive Serie A game this season. Their defense has been in shambles uh, throughout the season, but right now, it feels like they are picking up form a little bit. Um, one, two, uh, zero losses in the last uh, four Serie A games. Three wins and one draw. Zaccagni scoring two. Immobile also scored a beautiful penalty. Um, and this brings Lazio in sixth position. Only two points behind Atalanta, who, however, have got one game in hand. On a Saturday night, we also had the Torino Venezia. Um, Venezia ended up winning for the first time since November 21st, 2-1. A goal was disallowed to Belotti at the very <laughs> last minute for a millimetric offside. But if offside is a rule, that was offside and it was right to call it. There was a VAR check. The Torino bench were furious. Um, but this means that... Uh, Torino have now lost their second consecutive Serie A game. They haven't won one since defeating Sampdoria 2-1 away from home on January 15th. 
And then on Sunday, we had AC Milan Sampdoria that we have already talked about. And then two draws at the bottom of the league. Empoli Cagliari 1 1 goes by Inter Spinamonti and the Pavoletti. And then Genoa Salernitana 1 1 goes by Destro and Bonazzoli. What does that mean for, Salern- for Salernitana? We said that these two games against the Spezia and Genoa, they were kind of the games to try and, uh, you know, get some points. They didn't manage. They only got two, which is better than nothing, but it doesn't really change the situation for them. They're still last, trailing three points behind the Genoa. However, they've got one game in hand against the Venezia. That could be big okay. for them. There are rumors about a certain Andrea Pirlo maybe going to coach Salernitana. Would you get the job if you were good old Andrea? I think that's not a bad move. I think if if we've seen anything this season is that Pirlo might have been judged a little bit harshly at Juventus. Um, maybe he's a better coach than we gave him credit for. I think they could definitely do worse than him. And him cutting his teeth, so to speak, a little bit more in Serie B might not be bad for him either, because I, I doubt that he's going to keep him up, right? But if he can get him promoted back from Serie B, get a bit more confidence, I think that's not a bad move for either side, really. Um, it, feels, it feels like the ownership, the new Salernitana ownership, have got big plans for mm. the future. But if I were if I were Andrea Pirlo, he's already been ripped apart for the Juventus job. I would go for something a little easier than trying to save Salernitana, not saving them, and then having to come back next year. I don't know. If I were a good old Andrea, I would probably steer away from that job. But we were talking about goalkeeper Galore. It wasn't only Mr. Vladimiro Falcone from Sampdoria, but also Lorenzo Montipo. Rory is celebrating right. because he's This is he's my first him. clean sheet of the Fanta Calcio season, guys. I'm almost certain this is my first clean sheet of the Fanta Calcio season. And Lorenzo Montipo had an incredible game against the Udinese. He saved everything there could mm-hmm. be saved. But we got to talk about two guys that have been performing so much for Verona this season. Verona come out 4-0 winners with goals by De Pauli, Barak, Caprari and Tamez. But Barak and Caprari, they are having an incredible season. And Rory is smiling again because he's got Barak in fantasy football, right? And I've got Brecalo, the one guy who did score for Torino. I've got him in my team. Barak scoring again. I missed him for the hat trick, but I got him this time. I got him this time. Mate, he's having a great season, Barak. I really nine, like him as a player. Nine, nine goals and four assists for the Czech this season, while for uh, Caprari, it's uh, also nine goals and six assists. Oh, so mate, that 18, front three, that yeah. front three is really good. 18 goals and 10 assists combined between uh, Barak and Caprari. And then there is Giovanni Simeone up front with also 12 goals and three assists. Now, this is a team, we've talked about them earlier in the season, coached by Tudor. He was assistant manager at Juventus last year under Pirlo. And uh, this team is really doing big things this year. They're in ninth place, 36 points, only six behind Lazio, who are in the Conference League. I wouldn't be surprised if the Giallo Blue managed to snatch a point in Europe. And then, of course, it's a Roma who can't have a nice Sunday, a nice stroll in the they park. Just can't do it. Um, they, they go up 1 0 thanks to a Tammy Abraham penalty. But then there is an own goal by Roma's goalkeeper, Rui Patricio. Terrible own goal. This is a goalkeeper who's been performing this season. Kind of unlucky, but also, what are you doing, dude? Uh, Traore <laughs> makes it 2-1 for Sassuolo. And then at the death of time, 94th minute, it's Brian Cristante who makes it 2-2 to rescue a point for the Giallo Rossi. Uh, in their last uh, three games, one win, one and two draws for Roma, including one against Genoa. Do you think, Rory, that Mourinho is going to stay another season there? I think he's got a... I, <laughs> I'm i fully willing to be proven wrong here, but I think he sees it as a bit of a project. I think he sees it as a bit of like, he knows that clubs aren't queuing up to take him anymore. There's not that bigger move ahead of him. I think he sees this club as like, if I can do something here, this could like solidify my legacy in Italy and I will have one country that thinks I'm a god. Like, because Inter fans still adore him. If he, do, if he wins any trophy at Roma there'll be a statue of him. Like, I think he sees this as his opportunity to cement his legacy. What do you think? 
I yeah, I it's it's actually a pretty good take. I agree with you. Um, we shall see. I want him to be doing better. I kind of want Mourinho's yeah. Roma to become a thing in Serie A, but it's not going to be for this season. Right now, they are sitting. Let me check the standings. They are sitting seventh, uh, two points behind Lazio, but the competition right there is pretty fierce with Fiorentina, who are playing tonight against Spezia, mm -hmm. Verona that we've talked about, and slightly behind Torino as well. But the last game of the weekend in Serie A was Atalanta-Juventus. <sighs> what a game. Great game. Great one, one. one. Just really enjoyed it. Just really enjoyed it. Beautiful game. Yeah. I think there were two red cards, one on Chesney for absolutely mm -hmm. taking down Cop Mine and Cop Miners. I'm waiting for my Instagram page, Errori Arbitrali, refereeing mistakes, mm -hmm. to kind of shed a light on why he wasn't even booked in that. I instance. think it's his body language because he goes like that and tries to pretend that he's getting out of the way. I think that while running the... into the guy. Yeah, no, but I think that I think that makes the ref go, oh well, he's his intention wasn't there. Honestly, I think that's what it hinged on because there's no other reason why that's not a red card. He just barrels into him. Like, yeah, and, ridiculous. And then the, the other yellow card, the other red card uh, that is absolutely a no-brainer for me is mm -hmm. Ate Burr going with his studs up like a foot from the ground yeah. on uh, the Shilio, maybe. Uh, and that, in my opinion, is a straight red. No doubt. He got a yellow. And then Gasperini started arguing with the ref. I was like, what are you arguing about? Are you actually telling him <laughs> that, he, that he should have been given a red? Yeah. Uh, I have no idea what he was arguing about. But the goals came late Ooh. in the game. Malinovsky, what can Man. we say about that goal? I saw that he scored 22 goals for Atalanta. 13 have been from outside the box. Boom. Yeah. What a, His left foot, man. Absolutely beautiful. He spanks that, and the dip on it is beautiful. He's a player I enjoy watching. Um, Unsavable. Unsavable it, it, Absolutely beautiful goal. I was really, really annoyed that that Juventus goal went in. I, was, I feel like it was a bit lucky. It was scrappy. It was just... I was so annoyed it went in. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was very annoying to see Juventus rescue point through Danilo at the 92nd minute, right at the death of time. A point that means a lot for Juventus. Uh, they're sitting in fourth place right now. Atalanta are behind them with one game in hand that will have to be played against Torino at home. And we know that Atalanta have not collected that many points at home this season. So we shall see what happens. Um, another thing that I have to say about this game, it frustrates me so much to see how good Vlaovic is. The guy gets the ball, <laughs> needs a split second to look at the goal and just create this trajectory that always creates problems to the goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. Insane. No and at a point, he could have had a goal if Dybala hadn't been a selfish bastard trying to do yeah. Trying to score, he could have scored. You saw him right pointing the... at his feet. He was like, "Mate, I'm right here." He, he like, was like, I'm right what, here. "What can I do better?" Yeah, the defender yeah. kind of like drops away from Vlaovic to go tackle Dybala, and at that point, you just have to pass it in the middle of the box. And with the Vlaovic in the middle, it's always, always a goal. And tonight we've got the Fiorentina Spezia by Spezia Fiorentina. Sorry, by the time you're listening to this pod on a Tuesday, you will know the result. But it's time to go to the Premier League. Rory, 12 minutes before we jump to the Champions League. Premier League. I'm going to try to not spend it all talking about one club and one person. But here we go. So, um, listeners, I'm going to let you guess who we are talking about. So, some of our listeners have described him as a liability that has grown an even bigger head than his physique needs to be dropped and is not a traditional Man United player. We have, I'm sure he has a lot of qualities, but he's doing a great job of keeping them hidden from view. Um, <laughs> there are so many players that seem to fail at United. I don't think it's necessarily him. Even Ronaldo hasn't scored or assisted yet. And he's been, he's been completely driven out of his comfort zone playing for United. They're asking him to play a role akin to a genuinely gifted centre-back, which he isn't. Thanks for your opinions, guys. We are, of course, talking about Harry Maguire and Manchester United. Man, what a <laughs> performance. What a performance. I put on the second half um, because I try not to watch United games because I was like, whenever I turn on, they seem to win. Um, but I put on the second half and all I saw was a Harry Maguire run around like a pub drunk <laughs> who was constantly... I want to say 20 yards off the pace is being kind. He should have given away a penalty. He just... He ran, he got skinned by Brozier, right? Made to look an absolute fool of. He then chases Brozier down, just pushes him over in the box and stamps on his leg. For some reason, not a penalty. It was honestly one of the worst 
like one of the most calamitous defensive performances I've ever seen. And it's like, there's so much wrong at United and there's stories now, like the players are leaking stories about the changing room. They're like, they've apparently, they've said they don't like Ranjik. He's not good enough. They want Pochettino. Um, they've nicknamed his American assistant, Ted Lasso, because they don't respect him. Like it just, <laughs> all the stories that come out of it just make them sound like a bunch of spoiled pricks who just don't like the fact that a manager is asking them to try hard. Um, Ralph Hassenhuttle, the Southampton manager, came out afterwards and said, well, we know that on the transition, like for the reverse gears, not all the players join in. So like it's an open secret that the players aren't trying now. They're not putting a shift in with the defensive side. All this doesn't help Maguire. But I honestly, I've been, whenever I talk to my friends at home, I'm like, tell me why Maguire is good. Just tell me why he's a good player. Because I do not see it. Like, and I've not seen it since he was at Leicester. I think for England, he's done a good job because he's asked to do a different job. He's not a ball playing defender for England because he's shit at ball playing. Like, but I, I've, and I'm just, I can't understand how he cost 80 million. We bought Ben White and Gabriel, Gabriel Magalhaes for less, and they're turning into a great partnership. Maguire could be one of the biggest transfer flops. Honestly, I think he's just so endemic of what's wrong at United at the moment. The fact he's club captain is mental. Um, even when you go back to last season when he was accused of like bribing police and fighting in Greece and stuff, and you're like, is this a guy you make club captain? Like, I don't know. It's just, he seems to sum up everything that's wrong at that club at the moment. Um, he is a lightning rod. I do feel slightly sorry for him. Um, but I feel like also he's not, there doesn't seem to be much personality behind him. There's no personality in his performances. There's no, like, it doesn't seem like he's particularly trying hard. I don't know. I think he just, it really was grim viewing for Southampton. They just knew what to do. Even when United got into the lead, they were like, oh, it's fine. Just wait. They'll miss all their chances. We'll get a chance and we'll get back in the game. And that's exactly what happens. United can only play for 45 minutes for some reason. They have a really good performance first half. Second half, they're always crap. Um, so anyway, they drew one all. <laughs> I think it's like their fifth one all in a row or something. They keep drawing games. Um, but for Southampton, they've now won away at Tottenham, drawn at Old Trafford. They're on a 10-game unbeaten run now, I think. They're having an unbelievable run of form, Southampton. They're doing really, really well. But United, it makes such grim view. And I think the worst thing is these stories coming out of the changing room. Even Gary Neville came out this weekend and was like, look, we don't tell the public who the sources are, like who the players are in the squad that are leaking it, but we know who they are. He's like, I know who they are. I'm not going to say it. But and he was basically talking to the United players, going, "I know which ones of you are leaking these stories." Like, and he's still a big influential voice at United. I think it's just the whole club is a complete car crash at the moment. And the the really worrying thing I heard now this was because I don't know if it's true or not, but it was on the Transfer Window podcast. Um, one of the journalists on there is Daniel Story and Ian McGarry. I think one of them said that there was players in the United dressing room that were upset at how Greenwood had been treated. Which, wow. if that's true, if that's right. true, is one of the most disgusting things I've heard. Now, I, it could just be like papers are seeing that any story at the moment is being believed, so they're just throwing this out. But there were, there are respected journalists that have said, I have heard this. So it, it, the, the club is not a good place to be at the moment. Um and in the table, it looks like top four could be a struggle for them. Like, well, it I'm, could not, be I'm a... not surprised that Ronaldo would be would think that uh, Greenwood's <clears throat> treatment was unfair. Very, yeah. very true. They <laughs> they may have things in common. Who knows? They may have certain interests in common. We can't speculate as to what they are, but they may have shared shared similar experiences. That's a very good point, Tommy. Um, for the top four, it means United are now in fifth place on 40 points. So they're only one point behind West Ham. They've got a game in hand over West Ham, um, but Arsenal are just behind them. Two games in hand and only one point behind again. United just need to start winning games. These draws are doing them no good at all. Uh, but I think Ranić's got a real battle on his hands to try and turn this round. A real battle on his hands, especially if the players have no respect for him, then how long before he's gone and they're looking for someone else, if you know what I mean? And if I was the United owner and the, the players are saying, we want Poch, the last thing I would do is hire Poch. I would do, I would be looking for someone who's going to get these players in line, not someone that they're going to be 
looking to stay at a holiday camp for. It kind of happened at Arsenal. Like after a while, people realize that it's not the managers, it's the players. Yeah. Like people go, oh, well, it didn't work with this manager. It didn't work with that manager. It didn't work with that. Okay, well, it must be the fucking players. Like Van Hall has been saying it since he was there. Mourinho said it. Like Oli said it. Now this is like the fourth, fifth manager. They're like, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe there's a deeper issue here. Um, so mm-hmm. I think they're starting to realize what's going on there. Thankfully, at Arsenal, it seems like they realized it a bit quicker. Not quick enough, but a little bit quicker. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Damn, Manchester United. I don't know how how come they've. What 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 is if if it was a domino effect? What was the moment that started this downfall? Um, Sir Ferguson quitting, like retiring. What was? Yeah, it? him leaving and the Glazers buying the club. Taking over. Yeah. <laughs> the Glazers well, buying the club and uh, like Sir Alex was holding that together. He was desperately holding that together he saw where it was going and i think he was going to retire anyway but i think he picked his moment very well he had that last championship winning team and then he was like these owners aren't going to let me build another team like i'm yeah. gone like and it, i think that was the moment they've just really not been able to to steer the ship again they've not had a director of football they've not had football people in charge of the club it's all just been a bit rudderless and like yeah, for United fans, it must be fucking awful. I, I personally am enjoying it a little bit, like, but for <laughs> United fans, it must be awful. But Rory, when are you gonna leave? When are you gonna eat your dessert at the end of the Premier League talk? Uh, is it coming soon? Um, we're gonna talk about. Should we talk about Newcastle or Everton? Who do you want to talk about, Tommy? Well, let's talk about Everton. A very convincing win, and let's man, talk about Everton. fucking hell, that guy! I love him. I've okay. I haven't watched that much Premier League this season, but. Whenever I see a goal by, uh, wait, was it Richarlison who scored? When did I see that beautiful Richarlison goal? Was it against? Yeah, Richarlison. Well, Gordon was given the goal in the end, but Richarlison hit it. Yeah. What? He was given the goal. Why? Yeah, Gordon got the last touch on it. Oh God damn it! <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, yeah, proper stole his goal. Like. Well, what yeah, a beautiful yeah. assist by Richarlison. <laughs> Every time I see Richarlison uh, in the highlights, that guy can hit a ball. Jesus Christ. Mate, he's a great player. He's a great player. I always think he must have some massive personality fault because no other clubs can him, come in for him. I don't know what. Like the guy is ridiculous. He's a great player. He scored. He had like three goals disallowed against Arsenal. Like he absolutely tore us to pieces. Um, great player. Everton. I think this is going to be their season. It's going to be like massive highs, like batter one team, and then they're just going to get battered, and it's just going to be like up and down, up and down. But for Everton, there was a few players who I think like. They've been getting a little bit of stick, and they have some great performances. Van der Beek, he gets he he gets his before he gets his his start right. Plays in the game, ten recoveries, one interception. Key to everything um, Everton did attacking wise. Really like the performance we expected to see from him. The performance we kind of saw in flashes at United when he was given a chance. Really, really great performance from him. And Alex Awobi, a player who is ex Arsenal, so he does have a bit of a place in, in my heart, as much as he did annoy me a lot when he played for us. He created the most chances in the game, five chances he created, and captain and goal scorer Seamus Coleman was seen talking to him at the end of the game, like, yes, lad, that is what we need. That is what you're capable of. You can do this. Coleman is a great manager, a, a great um, captain. I'm sure he'll be a great manager as well, but great captain, icon for Everton. And I think he, like, seeing things like that, you can see that maybe the mood is shifting a little bit at Everton. Yeah. Everybody hated Benitez. No one was happy he was there. I think Lampard, although we've talked about him tactically, one thing he is, is a legend that players will look up to and want to play for. Like, So I think we could see a mood change at Everton. They're still not out of trouble, and they will need to find some level of consistency. Um, so Norwich are on 17 points, uh, just in third from bottom. Everton are on a 22 points. They've got a five-point gap. They've got a couple of games in hand on Norwich as well. It's just key that they win those games because that is their first win in five for Everton. So it is key that they follow this up with another win and not just start losing again. But a great performance from them. Um, very quickly, Newcastle, steady, like steady, steady improvement. Again, 1-0, a very good 1-0 win against Aston Villa. Aston Villa were terrible, but Dan Burn at centre-back, man of the match performance, unbelievable. The only bad news for Newcastle is that Kieran Trippier 
seems to have broken his foot. So we're not sure how long he's going to be out for. Um, but their next games are West Ham, Brentford and Brighton. So Newcastle could follow this form up um, ten, quite ten easily. Points, ten points in four games for Newcastle, yeah. for the Magpies. Jesus. That, like, that... they really are turning it around. Um, for Aston Villa, Steven Gerrard absolutely obliterated the Villa players. He's already said he's going to be making wide-scale changes in the start in 11. Just said they were too slow, not aggressive, not interested. He was angry. But for Newcastle, the first performance that they've won where you're like, oh, they dominated that game. They dominated it. Um, so, yeah, it looks like things are a little bit rosier for Newcastle. They're still not out of trouble, but Leeds could be getting dragged in, which I'm really not happy about. Um, but, yeah, Newcastle look like they could be working their way out of trouble gradually. The dessert, Let's do it. No, wait, Brighton picking up a win. Oh, first Brighton win, won. Brighton. Se- second win in 2022. And again, just you guys know that I have a soft spot for Brighton because that's the city where a seagull shat in my head back in 2006. <laughs> but hey, can I say something? They were they didn't do shit in the second half of the season, really. Like they, they've yeah, yeah. drawn a lot of games, 1-1, 1-1, 1-1. But at the same time, those points that you make at the beginning of the season, they matter in these moments. You win one game, and then all of a sudden, yeah. you're just like, hey, that's pretty Wait, good, They're right? ninth. They're ninth. Yeah, they're, they're ninth. Having a they're great doing well. Season. They're not going... Are they going to Europe? No, I don't think so. But still, good things for the goal. Manchester City, Norwich, 4-0. Is that even news? Oh, um, Raheem Sterling now only has eight players ahead of him in terms of um, numbers of Premier League hat-tricks. He's now scored five... Premier League hat tricks. Um, and I think it's about time Raheem Sterling got a bit of respect on his name. Yeah. Um, only him and Salah have scored 10 goals in the last five Premier League seasons, uh, or over 10 or more goals um, in the last five Premier League seasons. He's a player that consistently gets slagged off. Yes, he could be more uh, composed in goal. He probably should score more, but actually his numbers are pretty insane. Um, For England, he was massive at the Euros and people still don't rate him. I don't know what this guy has to do for people to actually respect him. He's an unbelievable player. Okay, it's Norwich, but fifth hat-trick, that puts him level with people like Van Persie, Ian Wright, Dimitar Berbatov. Like He's in pretty um, pretty good company there. Pocket Rocket says that Sterling is overrated, Rory. Deal. To Arsenal. Absolute deal. <laughs> Sterling, pers- Sterling said that his career was changed by Mikel Arteta, Mikel Arteta coaching him. If he wants to reunite with Arteta, yes, please, I would take him all day. You mad? Yes. And Rory, I'm making you sweat for your dessert. Just a word on Leicester, West Ham 2-2. Um, Leicester can't hold a lead. West Ham, absolute grit. Jared Bowen. Unbelievable player. Craig Dawson, last-minute winner. Was it handball? I don't think it was. Lots of people do. And finally, it's time for your favorite moment of the oh, episode. Oh, this is, it's it's been fun recently. dessert. <laughs> Let's go to North London, oh, shall we? This is glorious. I think <laughs> today, right, there's a pundit that I actively um, avoid because he's a moron, Jamie O'Hara. Um, I've muted him on Twitter. I've muted TalkSport on Twitter. But today I actively searched out his Tottenham rant because I was like, I want to listen to this more on Moan about how bad they are. (laughs) Um, They are fucking terrible. Um, Their defense is all over the place. Now, Hugo Lloris, again, for a while, I've been saying, this guy is done. After that injury, it was a horrific injury. I was like, after that injury, I just think he's a little bit past it. Tottenham need to be thinking about replacing him. I've been saying it for a while. He had an absolute stinker. Both goals were arguably, well, him and Davison Sanchez's fault. Um, they haven't got the defenders to play a back three. Ben Davies is terrible at it. Davison Sanchez looked less than disinterested. Um, at right back, do you pick Royale or do you pick Doherty? Like, both are shit. Um, they're just really, really bad. Really bad. And Wolves, on the same hand, Wolves were unbelievable. Like, Wolves are so well coached. They're having a great season. They're arguably... Kind of, they could be favourites to finish in top four the way they're playing. Um, and the the thing with Wolves is, against Arsenal, right, we scored first. At that point, Wolves find it quite difficult because they don't score many goals. But if they get in front, they do not concede goals. So the second they go 1-0 up, they just, they are, they are coached so well, they just do not concede. So I think for Tottenham, the second they scored one, they were gifted a second. It was game over. The second half, they may as well have not played it. Antonio Conte, as you said at the top of the show, first time he's lost three games in a row in 12 years. 
he looks defeated. Um, he said that maybe, what was it? The expectations they have for this season are not realistic. They need to be reviewed. Um, the problem is that if he expects if he expects money in the summer and he expects a chance to improve this squad, he is going to be bitterly disappointed because Daniel Levy doesn't play that. He does not do that. And the best thing I saw, like, it sums up Tottenham so much. They built this new stadium, right? Beautiful stadium. They're now, they have the most empty seats per game, right? So they're not filling the bloody thing, right? Then when they do fill it, but, right, imagine going to the stadium, Tommy, and this happens, right? You're at home. You're 2-0 down to a, sorry, Wolves, but a mid-table team. You go into the concourse to get a beer, yeah. and there's live music. There's a guy with an acoustic guitar playing Oasis or whatever it was. I thought, what is this? What, what, is this? Is, is this? I, I know the stadium was built for the NFL, but you don't have to do everything like the NFL. By right? now, you should have somehow realized <laughs> Mate, what you got to do. It was I was like, what is going on at that club? Um, I just can't imagine how angry you would feel. Just stop throwing bottles at that fucking band. Like, that would be that is such, a, such, a, such an incredible juxtaposition. Conte literally being held back by his assistants not to punch in the face and in the background. Because maybe you're going to be the one that saves me. 2-0 down at home after. to Wolves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it Lord. Was, oh, it Lord. was brutal. But I think um, there was an ex-Tottenham player who came out this week. Um, I can't remember who it was, but he said that he thinks Tottenham are out of the top four race now. He thinks it is done for them. If we quickly go through the table, they are, I'm going to enjoy this a little bit, they are eighth on 36 points, having played 22 games. Arsenal are currently in sixth on 39 points, having played 22 games. They are 36, five points off fourth spot. I think unless they massively turn this form around, they're in trouble. But who do they play next, Tommy? Tottenham, Arsenal. I don't know. Man City away. <laughs> so the form is not going to improve anytime soon. They did beat Man City at home. I don't think they're doing it away. I don't think they're doing it But Rory, it can I say one thing? If Arsenal do not go to the Champions League it's with awful. after yeah. this weekend, it's, I mean, we can make fun Everything. of Tottenham and all we want, but yeah. it, it's all in your hands. Mm -hmm. if you fuck Everything this is up, happening for it's us. All in your hands. United are drawing every game. West Ham are drawing a lot. Spurs have been losing. We've beaten Wolves. You're like, everything's building for it. And it terrifies me, Tommy. It terrifies me because we're in a good position. And that's what scares me. That's what scares me. I know, man. So for a long time when Inter were struggling, I'd rather have them chasing rather than being with the game in, mm -hmm. games in hand, like top, because you're just like, oh, God, we're going to fuck this up. We're going to fuck this up. And I have to say, our games in hand are something like Liverpool, Chelsea, and United, or something like. They're not easy games in hand. <laughs> like they are, they're games that we're not guaranteed to win. No, Tottenham, Chelsea, and Liverpool. No, Tottenham, so, Chelsea, and United. So it's Chelsea, they're difficult games. Yeah. Chelsea, Tottenham, and uh, I'm gonna go up, 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 up. It feels like it's a, it. What Chelsea and Tottenham? It feels like no, and Lee, Chelsea and Tottenham. That's what I see here. Yeah, maybe that's it then. We got two games in hand. Oh, we got three on West Ham. It's so confusing, Tommy. Yeah, just Chelsea and Tottenham then. And um, Liverpool, maybe. Yeah, Liverpool, maybe. I don't yeah, know. Which so if we can win <laughs> if we can win one of them, I'd be happy. But if we can get four points out of that, I'd be pretty happy, I'll be honest. Um, but it's time to jump to the champions. Because on Tuesday night, tonight for you listeners on a Spotify. Apple Podcasts, or what not, YouTube, maybe. We've got PSG, Real Madrid tonight. Neymar and Sergio Ramos won't be playing, but still, Messi and Bappe are going to be there. Uh, PSG coming from a last-minute win through the feet of Kylian Bappe, who else, at the 93rd minute against the Rance, the Rance player looked so pissed off. They were just like, Jesus Christ, 93 minutes of football, we didn't concede at the 93rd minute, we lose 1-0. Um, PSG are coming from four consecutive wins in um, in Ligue 1, conceding only one goal, and it was last week against Lille. On the other hand, 
Real Madrid uh, couldn't break the deadlock against the Villarreal this weekend. Um, they've won two of their last uh, four um, La Liga games, uh, but it doesn't feel like they're the most in form at mm-hmm. the moment. Benzema has been out injured for at least two weeks, but Ancelotti said that he should be playing this game. The game is going to be held in Paris at 9 p.m. Central European time on Tuesday. Rory, what? how do you see this game going? This is going to be an interesting one, right? PSG are fresh off that 5-1 battering of Lille. Um, Nobody's really impressed with how Poch has got them playing, but they obviously have the propensity to play very, very well. The interesting kind of narrative here is basically Kylian Mbappe playing against Mm -hmm. what is basically his future team, right? Um, But he has said in the press, this will not affect my performance. So basically admitting that he wants to go to Real Madrid, although he's not been secretive about it. I think this is the game of... Well, I don't know. Is it no? It's not the game of the week. We're going to talk about the game of the week, but this is the game of tomorrow. Um, I think it could. I think it could be a really, really interesting one. It feels like a proper European night. But I'm going to say Real Madrid, with their experience, get a result here. Over the two legs or on the first game in Paris? Um, I'm going to say in Paris. I'm going to say they turn up and do it. I'm going to say draw in Paris. I'm Bale say... to score. Bale to score. He's been back. I want to see Bale. I want to see the redemption arc at Real Madrid. I, I want to see it. I don't think he's going to be a starter. He played the 76 minutes, which is definitely the longest he's played this season <laughs> in a single game. <laughs> Not going to play in the Champions League. Uh, I want to say this game is going to be a draw. And Opeless Wanderer is saying that Benzema is still injured. Yesterday I heard Ancelotti, I read that Ancelotti said that he might be available. And Neymar should be out, though. I don't know. Nah. I so, think it's, it's, maybe it's all just mind games for the managers. Like, is he playing? No is he not playing? It's all smoke and mirrors, right? No idea. But the Hopeless Wanderer is a knowledgeable man. Also, check out their podcast, the Hopeless Wanderer podcast, of course. And then we've got the Sporting Lisboa against Man City. Rory, did you see any of the pictures of the massive brawl that ensued between Porto and Sporting at the end of the her of the game? Was that Pepe picking the player up? Player. No, that was Charisma, wasn't it? That was there was a lot of craziness in Liga Nosh this weekend. Well, the four people got reds, and one of them, okay. of course, was Pepe. How could he not get a red card That's when it. there is a brawl? That's the it. guy turns into a dog. But uh, Sporting, <laughs> Sporting Lisboa are currently sitting second in Liga Nosh behind. I want to say Porto. Porto. Yeah, let me check. Behind Porto, the six points off it. Yeah, six uh, f- six points behind the Porto. They've drawn the last game against the table leaders, 2-2. And Man City, what can we say about them? They're on a tier in the Premier League. They seem unstoppable. Only Southampton managed to get a draw against mm-hmm. them recently. For the rest, you can check your football app. It's a bunch of green boxes. Rory, predictions on the final score? I think this is going to be like 4-0. I think City are going to absolutely run riot here. The thing is, the team that um, Sporting Lisbon have played that is closest to City is Ajax in terms of the football they play. And Ajax put some numbers up against them. I think they beat them 5-1 at, um, in Lisbon. So I think I'm really not holding my breath for, for Sporting. But it'll be a nice experience for the fans. They get to see City play, right? I don't know. I think, honestly, this is going to be as one-sided as you could ask. Yup, and then we've got on Wednesday, Salzburg, Bayern, Bayern Ooh. Munich, losing 4-2 this weekend. One of the goals from their position over the weekend at Bochum. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced it correct. I want to say that the goal scorer was Holtmann, was an absolute banger. Um, they lost the 4-2. Doesn't happen often for the Bavarians. But do you think, Rory, that Salzburg have got a chance against them in the Champions League? No. No? Just as clear as that? <laughs> no, right. no, I think, I think look, uh, again, they're a team that creates great young players. They play nice football, but this is Bayern Munich in the Champions League, guys. This is not... Like, they're not here to fuck about. And it's Bayern that have just been, like you said, just been smashed by Bochum. This is a hurt Bayern. This is a Bayern that's ready to take revenge on an unwitting um, victim. I think, also, I was looking at this. Does this count as a local derby, Tommy? They're only an hour and a half away from each other. Does it count as a local derby? 
Mm, yeah, but I wouldn't say that. Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't say that Nice Genova is a derby. Well, yeah, maybe it would be Nice Sampdoria. That would be kind of a derby. Right, I feel like, like there'd I... be a bit of there should be a bit of heat between these teams. Although well, the Austrians yeah. and German, the Austrians and Germans love each other, don't they? As we know historically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there is a famous German that was actually Austrian, but we're not <laughs> going to reveal the name. And the famous Nietzsche, uh, not Nietzsche. No, no. Sorry, no. Go, go, go. continue, continue. <laughs> right, right, and the right. famous Austrian who was actually German. That we can say the name. It was Mozart. In fact, oh, there we go. Say, yeah, 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 there yeah, is yeah, the yeah. ongoing joke that the. Austrians are very good at making people believe that Mozart was Austrian and Hitler was German when it was the other <laughs> way around. But the game that the Anglo-Italian pod is very interested in is the game that, luckily, I want to say, no, luckily, I'm going to be attending. It was the other day I I had to subscribe to an Inter club um, to, to get these tickets. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other day there was access uh, for only the Inter club members. And I was putting my numbers in and there was this virtual line going and honestly i have i hadn't felt that nervous in a while i was just like at a point i was just standing up like walking around smoking chain smoking cigarettes just like, <laughs> god damn it like why isn't the line moving why and then it appeared and i went to my computer and the battery died and i was like oh god no i plugged it in the line was still there i had to wait two more minutes when i got the ticket finally i went like yes oh. So I'm super excited, regardless of how this game will go. I'm super excited that I will get to see my team play against a Liverpool team that is going to be remembered forever and ever Mm -hmm. uh, as one of the best teams of this decade. So I'm super excited about that. On the other hand, man, whenever I'm going to see either Salah or Mane just sprint on the wing with that ball. And, it's terrifying. And I'm going to remember terrifying. that Andanovic is our goalkeeper. <laughs> so, <laughs> God damn it. But look. Well, that's a massive point. Yeah, I yeah. think we've got a chance. I think we've got a chance. If not to win the game, to get a favorable result, which would be a draw. We know that in these years, Champions Leagues, the uh, Champions League, the go- the away goals don't count more than the normal goals. Mm-hmm. I want to say that Inter will be. I think that Liverpool are going to underestimate Inter a little bit. I think we're going to get at least a goal. That's all I'm going to say, Rory. What do you think? I think it's going to be. This is the game of the week. I think this is going to be a really interesting, interesting game. I'm very jealous that you're getting to go. Um, I, the way I see it is there's no pressure on Inter. There's zero pressure on Inter. I think people largely expect Liverpool to go through. I think Inter can approach this as a let's see where we are against the kind of best in the in the continent. Um, Inter will definitely score. I just think Liverpool will score more. Uh, <laughs> I think the, the problem is in, they're replacing their players before they've gone. So they're replacing Mane, they're replacing like Firmino, and they're still at the clubs. Like they've brought in Jota to replace Firmino, they've brought in no. Luis Diaz to replace Mane, and it's kind of this like the, the cycle's already there. So it's kind of relentless. Um, I think if you can get a draw at the San Siro, then you've done pretty well. Adam from the Hopeless Wanderer says, agreed with all Inter to win 1 0. Uh, man, I would put. Where do I sign? Where, do, where is the paper? <laughs> yeah. Where is the paper and the pen? Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> then with these Champions League fixtures, you know that one nil is literally just like a little fart in the air yeah, before yeah. you go to Anfield and you get great. <laughs> That's just the thing, like, man. Anfield on the second leg is like, I know there's we, a lot of look, like bullshit around legacies and we, stuff, but that's... If big. we can get a 2-0 at the San Siro or a 3-1 or two goals, a, a two goals dif- uh, win with a two goals difference, yeah. that would be incredible. That would be honestly the the greatest I could expect. Um, 3-0, I wouldn't believe my eyes. 3-0, I, I, I would think I'm dreaming. I would probably I think you would from... be dreaming if that happened. Yeah. I, mean, I hate to break <laughs> it to you, but yeah, yeah. But yeah, just the fact that I cannot put a sentence straight to talking about this game should tell you how excited I am about it. Also because, a little throwback, in 2008, that was the very first Champions League game that I ever got to watch in my life. Nice. Inter Milan against Liverpool. And of course, we lost thanks to a Fernando Torres goal. Um, <laughs> and Jesus Christ, at the 
Adriano and Bri- Ibrahimovic were playing up front and they missed, they squandered every chance possible. <sighs> I remember at a point, Ibrahimovic, I felt like he was looking at me. I was just like, open goal, missed it. Adriano, <laughs> open goal, missed it. Then I, I think it was Cambiasso that missed another one. And then at the 76th minute, Torres scored. But yeah, it's going to be a, definitely a sentimental game for me. Hopefully, Inter win. But guys, we've run out of time. Remember to follow us on Twitter at Italian Anglopod. On Instagram at Anglo Italian Pod to give a little follow to our sponsor at the Sports Club Maps. You can find them both on Twitter and on Instagram. All I have to say is Forza Inter, Pazza Inter Amala. Hopefully, mm-hmm. we get we get a win. I think we need it. We've been working our asses off to get back to the round of 16. Uh, here we are. Let's honor the supporters. Let's honor the club. Let's honor the colors. And let's fucking get this win. Rory, anything to say to our listeners? 100th episode. We've yeah. done it. There we go. Thanks for listening, guys. We will see you on Friday with Tommy celebrating an Inter win. <gasps> Hopefully. Talk to you later, guys. Bye bye.